Is Alice Long here? Have you seen Alice? Uh, no. Was she help, supposed to help you? She was going to test the level. Now you can be careful because that other person we have standing up there is playing you. Jen, go up and stand up there. Oh, good. Is it going to be black and white? <laughs> Yeah, it's all black and white. It's not color. Oh, good. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is. Oh, we're gonna make an audio. Maybe I should tell the dark and serious. Are you reading the quotes? No, I'm doing the short story stories from the 1800s. Oh, great. I would have been. I was having. I thought I was having a heart attack. Oh, I couldn't figure out why I was having it. I thought, well, I'm so shy. And then I remember it was what I was doing as my exercises. I was doing my back last night. Who do you have that works on your back? Who's a physician here? It's a, my back's a problem. Okay. Oh, oh. Ah, good. Just to keep the shock of the knees going. You're not falling on your face either, you know. I mean, when you're putting your feet down like this and running, it's a lot of shock. Tennis. I had a career pass because I was I hit a backhand, and I don't want to get the first foot this knee. Well, it will. Oh, no, that's very I say, except I ended up at a chiropractor. This one of them, you know, let's face it, I was perfectly right. Did the chiropractor lift you? No, he's a real gentleman. Okay, the best way. It thinks it's recording right now. Both lights lit, it's recording. Having been immersed in the numerous volumes of prose uh, she's produced all since 1981, I can say with an ample <laughs> amount of confidence that Ellen Gilchrist has as powerful a voice as I've seen in the literature of our time, Southern or otherwise. Her characters and the predicaments they find themselves in are presented with a realism and an honesty that transcends region, genre, and social consciousness. When you open the jacket of a Gilchrist book, you enter another world, a world of romances lost and found, of <coughs> rules lame and disobeyed, a world that contains beauty and ugliness, that contains sweet wine and mayonnaise sandwiches. You take a trip, guided perhaps by Nora Jean Winnington or Rhoda Manning. Maybe you'll go to Mexico, maybe to New Orleans. But no matter where you go, you will feel the conflict, the search for happiness and safety and perfection that her characters endure, that conflict we all live in our own way. Gilchrist's characters are golden because they are both unique and representative at the same time. They can speak to a reader's hopes and fears while involved in an event or in a place that most could never have imagined. A rape at Mardi Gras that humbles a marriage and brings strangers together. A father-daughter jaunt to Houston for an illegal abortion that unveils the manning reality, the need to control and be controlled. An earthquake on the Golden Gate Bridge that tells a pregnant armed robber she's mortal. And a young wife's realization in the middle of a tragedy that she truly does not know her husband. On these trips, we discover ourselves, our own inabilities and failures and loves and desires. We become part of the text, part of the conflict. Rhoda's red hair and swimsuits and arrogant stares are as vivid to us as are the details of our own bodies, her family and friends and many lovers as dear to us as our own. Her story is our story, her life, our lives. Ms. Gilchrist discusses at one point in her collection of journals falling through space, a reluctant compliance to her father's wish that she take a course in the stock market. But during the first class meeting, she meets an engineer from Kansas and falls in love. She writes, we went off into the night and never found time to come back to the class. Each age has its rewards. Once I had love and romance, now I have the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Wall Street Week in Review. Like each age, the fiction of Ellen Gilchrist certainly has its rewards. She does what many of us strive to do in our writing and what all of us search for in the books that we read. 
She whisks us away from our living rooms and takes us into the night as though we had fallen in love with an engineer from our course in the stock market. She takes us away, but because her writing is true art, brings us back by mirroring in a fictive reality what is ever present in our own. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to present best-selling author and National Book Award winner, Miss Ellen Gilchrist. for three days over the weekend, and I, we were talking about he neither one of us were ever stuck up. <laughs> I've forgotten what a really wonderful word that I don't know if they use it anymore. I hope they do. I, uh, I'm going to read you two short stories from a book of short stories that I published a year and a half ago called The Age of Miracles. I was... Uh, trying to decide what to read you tonight, but I had a pain in my left arm and I decided I was having a heart attack, so I took my attention away and only had about three minutes to decide what to read <laughs> after I figured out that it was really just from doing some exercises because I pulled my back. Each age has its own rewards. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh. But um, hopefully there are enough students here that they won't really know what any of that means. I don't want anyone to know what any of that means until they have to. I'm going to read you a short story called Among the Mourners. It's told in the first person uh, voice of a little girl named Aurora Harris. <clears throat> the spring that I was 13 years old, a poet we knew died and we had to have the funeral. It was the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me in my life. In the first place, <laughs> do we need to see about that? In the first place, he killed himself, and the police couldn't even get his briefcase open to find the suicide note. And in the second place, it almost broke up my parents' marriage. Not that my mother minded my father offering to have the funeral. Somebody had to do it, I guess, and our house is always full of people anyway. She just goes back to her room and reads magazines until they go away. My dad is head of the English department, and there are always poets around telling dad their problems. I'm used to them, and so is she. But this was different. All those police cars pulling up in front of the house, and my little sister running around in her pajamas in the front yard, and everybody over there smoking cigarettes like it was going out of style. This was several years ago, when a lot of people still smoked inside the house. How would you feel if you had just gotten the first boyfriend you ever had, and every time his parents drove by your house, there were cars parked all over the yard and police cars in the driveway? I was mortified. His name is Giorgio, and his mother is from Peru, and his father is Jewish, and they don't have things like that at their house. They are very religious. Giorgio goes to the Catholic church with his mom, and he goes to the temple with his dad. They teach in the foreign language department, and they don't always have to have crazy people around like you do if your father is head of the English department. <laughs> Giorgio speaks about 15 languages, and he is so good looking you wouldn't believe it. He's pretty short, but I'm glad he is. I couldn't stand it if he was out playing football and I had to get out there and cheer for him getting his nose broken and his teeth cracked. I'm on the pep squad. I didn't want to go out, but my mother made me. She's always trying to make me have a normal life. Only how can I, with all my dad's crazy friends coming over all the time and my crazy little sister running around half naked and failing the first grade? I think they got her mixed up in the nursery. I don't believe she's related to me. Anyway, this poet that used to come over all the time and talk to Dad shot himself because his girlfriend had talked his wife into divorcing him. And the next thing I knew, there were about a hundred cars parked all over the yard on the day that Giorgio finally told me he liked me. <clears throat> 
My cousin bet him $10 he wouldn't tell me, and he called me up that night and told me. I don't think he got the $10, but he didn't care. He was so glad to have me for a girlfriend. He's in gifted and talented, and so am I. I've been liking him for ages, but I didn't know it until he called me up. That was about 6 o'clock one afternoon. That night, the poet shot himself, and the people started showing up. Aurora, my dad says, when he called me into his office to tell me what was going on, Mr. Alter has killed himself, and the widow is going to stay here until we can figure out a way to bury him. Why do you do that, I ask? We don't know. We'll need your room if Mr. Seats comes in from St. Louis. You remember Mr. Seats. He used to teach here. He can't have my room. I'm making a project for swim team. It's the decorations for the banquet next week. I backed off toward the door. If you get into my dad's office, he can talk you into things. It's, not, it's like there's not enough oxygen in there when he really gets something on his mind. Take Annie's room. It's filthy anyway. She's such a pig. Aurora, yes, sir. A man has killed himself. We have a civilized duty to mourn when someone dies. If Mr. Seats comes, we will leave your room. I didn't kill him. Why should I give up my room? <laughs> Aurora, I am deeply disappointed in you. It makes me very sad to hear you talk that way. Mr. Alter was a guest in this house. He was a friend of mine and of your mother's, and we're going to pay him the respect that's due. If someone kills themselves, they don't get my respect. Alice Armin, come in here. So he starts screaming for my mother. He always blames her when he gets mad at me, as if she can stop it. Sometimes I think I'm the one who was switched in the hospital. <coughs> Here's what they do that drives me crazy. They preach all the time about reason. Dharma, my dad calls it. He is so big on dharma. This was then the first time something happens, they start acting like these big Christians or something and having all these rituals. By 10 o'clock the next morning, the house was full. Mr. Seats caught the first plane he could get on and came on down and put his suitcase in his room. I will say this, he didn't touch anything. He just put his suitcase down and went into the living room and started watching television with Mother. He used to be a poet, but he had just got this job sending in dialogue for days of our lives, so he has to watch these soap operas all day. So he had to watch these soap operas all day, even while he was mourning. He was the best friend of Mr. Alter and had just seen him a few weeks ago. Also, he was suffering a broken heart because the person he loved in St. Louis wouldn't get a divorce and marry him. He was telling Mother all about it the first day he was there, and she's sitting on the sofa with him patting her on the hand. That's what almost broke up my parents' marriage, not to mention almost got the television taken out of our house for good. <clears throat> so here they are, all sitting around the house, drinking beer and iced tea and eating all the food everyone kept bringing over and waiting for the police to finish their, the investigation so they could bury the body. Giorgio's mother said she thought they should stop making a big deal out of someone young and in good health who would kill himself. It is an unholy act, she kept saying in this beautiful accent she has. They only live three blocks from us, so I started staying over there all the time. I couldn't stand it at my house with all these people coming in and out the doors and Mama sitting in the living room with Mr. Seats holding her hand. My dad is insanely jealous of my mother. He won't let anyone near her. He fell in love with her at first sight. She was the second runner-up for Miss Tennessee, and he met her when his roommate at the University of Kentucky had him up to visit one Thanksgiving vacation. She was good friends with the roommate's sister, and she came walking in a room, and he fell instantly in love with her. Then he swept her off her feet and married her and brought her to Fayetteville, Arkansas to live. As soon as they got here, they had me on a freezing cold January night. I'm an Aquarius, born in my own time. Only my parents don't like for me to talk about astrology. They say it's lower middle class superstition and not worthy of me. <laughs> They're afraid I'll get into a coven or something when I grow up if I start believing in astrology. 
They had Annie seven years lady, later, although they didn't mean to. <coughs> My mother is a sculptor, although she hasn't had time to do it since Annie was born. Annie wouldn't even go to kindergarten half the time. Then she failed the first grade. All she wants to do is ride her stupid bike or run around with hardly any clothes on or just hang on to dad like some kind of a monkey. She adores him. So what does she do while this funeral is going on but run around in these little pink nylon pajamas that are about 10 years old and too short for her and go from person to person being cute and getting people to talk about her to dad. She's a slut if I ever saw her. <laughs> She'll do anything for attention. That's why she failed the first grade, just to get attention. It makes me sick, I told Giorgio. We were sitting on the front wall looking at the house. You've never seen so many people going in and out of a house in your life. Mom's gonna have to throw our carpets away. There won't be any way to clean them. He thinks it is his job, Giorgio says. He's sitting right next to me and I can smell the Peruvian perfume his mother puts on everything he wears. Just to think, I waited all these years to have a boyfriend, and the minute I get one, they start having this six-day funeral at my house. Awake, my dad told me. This is awake. Where are they going to bury him, I asked. I don't say another word about Mr. Seats living in my room. He has barely opened his suitcase the whole time he's here. He thinks Mr. Alter has been appearing to him like a ghost. But does my father start screaming and say, don't get into that lower middle class superstition? <laughs> no, of course not. He just gets this serious look on his face and lets Mr. Seats talk all he wants to about seeing Mr. Alter's ghost behind the rocking chair in the living room and also in the front yard by the maple tree. I bet Mr. Seats told that story 50 times in one day. Every time I would walk through a room trying to get something to eat or take a bath or fi finish my decorations for the swimming team banquet, there he would be telling about the ghost behind the rocking chair. Are you coming to my banquet? I asked my mother finally. She and Mr. Seats were in the living room watching The Young and the Restless. Mr. Snyder was with them by then. He's my father's student assistant. Dad told him not to let them watch the television alone. I heard Mr. Snyder laughing and telling that to the widow like he was trying to cheer her up. Anyway, I believed it because every time they were in there with the TV on, Mr. Snyder was there too. They should not have involved you in this death, Giorgio's mother said to me. These self-murder. I can't even take a bath, I told her. It's a good thing I'm on the swim team. I might get impetigo or something. <laughs> I was late to practice yesterday because my mother couldn't back out of the driveway. They had this man there from the radio station. They've been playing this special program of all the dead guy's favorite music on the student radio station. He was there getting everyone to tell him which songs to play. This is so morbid, my poor baby girl, Giorgio's mother, then asked me to eat dinner with them that night, so I called, and they said I could, and Giorgio, Giorgio and I went into his room and listened to music and played Scrabble, just the two of us. No one bothered us or came in. Well, he's an only child, and his father is a workaholic, so there wasn't anyone there but us and his mother, and I could tell she wanted us to be alone and fall in love. She was real excited because I'm a gifted and talented too. <laughs> I want Giorgio to have friends who share his interests so he won't get involved with these football people. You should hear her say involved. She gives it about 14 syllables. She grew up speaking French and Spanish, and I could just live over there listening to her talk. I guess you think we were in there kissing and making out, but you are wrong. I would never take advantage of that woman. I wouldn't violate Mrs. Levine's trust for 15 carat diamonds for my ears. I wouldn't hurt that woman for all the money in the world. I love her with all my heart. Even if Giorgio did quit liking me, I would never do one thing to make Mrs. Levine unhappy. If it hadn't been for her, I would never have made it through the wake. 
Finally, on the Friday after he killed himself on Saturday, the police released the body and we all went up to the cemetery and buried him. He didn't have any parents. He was an orphan from the word go, which is what made it so tragic. The only one that ever loved him was his wife and he betrayed her with another woman and then he couldn't face the consequences of what he had done. These happen every day in my country, Mrs. Levine told me. We do not think these things are tragedies. Tragedy is for the poor widow or the child who loses his mother or when there is a war. These young men will have eternity to regret his act. It would be better if the living walked off and forgot his selfish life. Can Aurora spend the night tonight, Giorgio asked. She can sleep in the guest room. She hasn't had any sleep in days, Mama. She has to sleep with her little sister. I'm an insomniac anyway, I added, but that's okay. I can take it another night. Of course not. Of course you can stay here with us. I will call your mother and see if these is all right with her then. So listen, my parents are so wrapped up in this funeral, they said yes. They let me spend the night at a boy's house. I couldn't believe it. I was afraid to go home and get my pajamas and toothbrush. I was afraid my mom might change her mind if she saw me. Sometimes she can read my mind like a gypsy. I sneaked in the side door and grabbed some clothes and stuffed them in a bag and almost made it back out into the yard when Dad caught me. Where are you going, he says. By now they have buried Mr. Alter and are back at our house sitting around discussing the funeral. I'm in the back hall about four feet from the kitchen and Dad's blocking the way to the door. I'm going to church with the Levines, I said. You're doing what? My dad has spent his life listening to students. There is no fool on him. I raised my head and looked him in the eye. I think they're going to the synagogue, I said, or maybe to St. Joseph's. I'm freaking out from this funeral, Dad. The Levines asked me to stay with them, and Mom said I could. Mr. Harris, it was this graduate student named Belle Fontaine, who's a big favorite of my dad's. He had a faded red corduroy shirt in his hand. This was one of Francis's shirts. We thought you might like it for a souvenir. We cleaned out his closet, like you said. We brought this to you. I don't know, maybe you don't want it. He stood blocking the door to the kitchen with the dead poet's shirt in his hand. <laughs> my dad reached out and took it. I went under his arms and made my escape. Have to go, I said, they're waiting for me in the car. I was out the door. I had just told two lies in a row to a man who never forgets anything and is never fooled. I lit out across the patio and took the shortcut to the Levine's house, <clears throat> across the backyards of my piano teacher and some people from Indiana that no one ever sees. Giorgio and his mother were waiting for me. They were making paella for dinner. Mr. Levine was going to be late. We weren't going to have to wait for him. Everything went along just fine until Mr. Levine came home and he and Mrs. Levine went to bed, leaving Giorgio and me alone. You wanna go for a walk, he asked. They won't mind, they don't care what I do. It's 10.30 at night, sure I'd love it. We can walk up to the store. I was about five feet away from him and he smelled like that perfume. He reached out and took my hand and we just walked on out the door. We can go to the park, he said. Sometimes I go there at night. It's not far. I could walk a hundred miles. Who cares how far it is? So we started off down Washington Avenue. It was in between semesters at the college and the town was quiet. We walked down to Highway 71 and crossed at the IGA. There wasn't anyone around but old Donnie Heights, who is a lunatic that walks the streets all the time saying hello to people. He gives me the creeps. But Dad says he's proof there is still freedom in the United States and to count my blessings and be polite. Anyway, he was standing on the corner by the Shell station, so I held on tighter to Giorgio's hand and we crossed 71 and started up toward Washington Elementary School. That's where I learned to read, I commented. Right there in that corner room, Mrs. Norton taught me. She's the sweetest lady in the world and I adore her. I adore you, Giorgio says. He said that right there by the corner of the school on Maple Street. He got real near me and sort of breathed into my hair. That's all that happened then. 
We walked up Maple and cut over to Dr. Wildman's house and went on down to the park. At the wooden bridge, we stopped and sat down and started kissing. We just started kissing without saying a thing first. I bet there wasn't a person in the park. If it hadn't been for the lights and the houses on the hill, there wouldn't have been any light except for the moon and the stars. This is just like the old shepherds in the Bible, I said at last, or else the druids. It makes me think of death to be alone in the night, does it you? But all Giorgio did was put his hand on my breast and keep it there. I would have made him move it, but I wanted to know what it felt like. <laughs> it felt good, I can tell you that much. If I hadn't had to think about what it would be like when my dad got me in his office and started screaming at me, I might just have let him keep it there all night. <laughs> We'd better get back, I said. I was kissing him as hard as I could in between talking but I still have my braces on and it hurts to kiss very hard with them. Besides, last week I got a free certificate to the TGBY for not breaking any pieces off of them for a month, and I was trying to get another one. You better stop doing that, I added, and pushed his hand off my breast. He didn't fight me, he just ran it down my shorts and stuck his finger up inside my underpants. Just stuck it up right around the edge of my underpants. I don't know what would have happened, but a car full of teenagers pulled up on Wilson Street and got out and started running for the swing sets, which are only 40 feet from the bridge where we were lying. Something crashed in the creek. It was probably just a beer can, but it sounded like a hydrogen bomb. I stood up and dusted myself off. I already had about 500 chigger bites, but luckily I wouldn't know that until morning. <laughs> That's all there is worth telling about that night. We walked back to the house. Giorgio was acting like he was mad at me. He was pouting, if you want to know the truth. He was acting like he was about five years old. He's spoiled rotten, to tell the truth. <laughs> Besides, in another couple of years, he'll be too short for me. We're already the same height, and my mom is five foot seven, and my dad's six five. This wasn't going to last. <laughs> so I don't care if he told my best friend he doesn't like me anymore. Mr. Seats has twin boys my age that live up in Minnesota. When he comes down next winter to be the poet in residence, he's going to bring them with him. He thinks they will both fall in love with me. They always fall in love together, he told me while he was packing up his stuff to leave my room. And you can have them both, Aurora. <laughs> so what do you think? Do you think Giorgio quit liking me because I let him put his hand on my breast? Or because I wouldn't let him put it in my underpants? Or because there were police cars outside my house for seven days? <laughs> my dad would say that's like trying to figure out why Mr. Alter killed himself. He believes in the theory of random acts. He thinks lightning strikes. He thinks we should just live every day and do the best we can. Also, this is the last funeral, funeral we'll have to have. Before they left, my dad called all the people into the living room and told them that this was the last time he was going to a suicide's funeral. If anyone else killed themselves, they were on their own for getting buried. This has had a negative effect on my children, he said. He knew I was listening in the hall. I am worried that I allowed them to witness it. Aside from that, I love you all and I wish you well. I noticed as soon as Dad made his announcement that Mr. Seats went into my room and took a shower and put on a shirt and tie and started acting like a grown up. My dad has the power to do things like that to people, but he usually saves it up and only uses it at the end. My parents are very cool people, to tell the truth. They aren't even going to make Annie go to summer school. They're just going to let her run around all summer in her bathing suit and try again next year. This is very advanced behavior for academics, and everyone was congratulating them on it while they were getting in their cars and leaving. You're right about Annie, people kept saying. Let her be a child. Don't push her, and so forth. Of course, why should they worry? They've got me. And I have them, again, more than I need. The television has a sign on it that says, goodbye, sequential thought, and a schedule of times <laughs> when Annie and I are allowed to watch it. 
Although I think the sign is really just to remind my mother that Mr. Seats has whored himself by agreeing to write the dialogue for a soap opera. Now that I know what it is they do when they go into their room at night, I'm looking at them with different eyes. I feel sorry for them to tell the truth. If I had to do that stuff every night, I might not be able to stay in gifted and talented. <laughs> or even be on the swim team. Here's the way I look at it. I look when I start thinking about it. Very soft around the mouth and chin like Bambi. Sort of big-eyed and stupid. Bowing my head to chew a little piece of grass. <laughs> very helpless and half asleep. While all around me, for all I know, the forest might be catching fire. <laughs> <laughs> students this afternoon tell them that the real reward of real hard work in writing serious <coughs> fiction, trying very hard to write the literature, is that occasionally a short story or a poem just kind of falls from the air and it's easy to write and it's a lot of fun and that was one of those. And <clears throat> I'm going to read you part of another story that's in the same collection that was also uh, a gift that I had a, a wonderful time writing and uh, the one time that I read part of this out loud. I read it at a benefit in New York for uh, literacy partners and lots of really wonderful writers were there and, and also many of the people who had benefited from the program who had learned to read as adults. It's a program that teaches adults how to read. In fact, so many good writers were there and they'd read so many wonderful things and I had a couple of books with me that the only thing I, that by the time it was my turn, the only thing that I could say to the, to the people who had learned to read in the program was that one of the reasons to learn to read and write was not just so that you could read Nikki Giovanni or Richard Ford or any of the writers that had preceded me, but also that you could uh, write irate letters when the time came, and that was really one of, one of the great joys of literacy. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is a short story made out, of a letter, made out of letters, and it's called The Uninsured. August the 1st, 1993. <coughs> Dear Blue Cross Blue Shield, I got your letter advising me that you are redoing our health insurance plans. I guess this means you're going to be raising our rates again. I know you want to raise my rates since for the past 10 years and it has cost you more to pay my psychiatrist than you have collected from me. We may be getting tired of each other. It may be time to sever our relationship, especially since I'm about to cut down on the number of times I see him each week and aside from that, I'm in perfect health. Yours most sincerely, Rhoda K. Manning. <coughs> A month later, September the 3rd, 1993. Dear Blue Cross Blue Shield, while I wait to see if you have figured out a way to make money from me instead of me making money from you, I have done the following at your expense. Had a mammogram and a pap smear, had a bone <laughs> density evaluation and scan, <clears throat> had an AIDS test, had a blood profile and blood pressure check. Had 10 small skin lesions removed from my hands and arms and lower legs. Had all my prescription drugs filled. I have also driven up to Jackson, Mississippi to visit my 86-year-old parents and found them both in perfect health. From all these tests and the evidence of my genes, it is clear that, barring accidents, I will live to be about 90 years old with no bone, heart, liver, lung, or brain disease. My blood pressure is 90 over 60. My bone density is that of a 30-year-old woman. It is obvious that if you raise my rates, I will have to consider bailing out of your flex plan. Yours most sincerely, Rhoda K. Manning. <clears throat> October the 10th, 1993. Dear Blue Cross Blue Shield, I have applied to the John Alden Insurance Company of Springfield, Illinois for inclusion in their Jayla Care program. 
I'm going to let the two of you bid for my healthy body. <laughs> a healthy body, I might add, which has been shored up by 20 years of psychotherapy, which has taught me to love, care for, and value myself. The John Alden representative in our area has come to visit me. He is a very nice man about my age who was once a forest ranger in Oregon. We chatted and drank bottled water and he took my medical history. He said that, with the exception of my 20 years of psychotherapy, he was certain my record would be well received at the John Alden Jayla Care Evaluation Center. I am not mentally disturbed, I told him. I am a writer. The reason I have never been blocked is because I have been in psychotherapy and therefore able to withstand the pressures of society upon my artistic nature. It is also the reason I have never been depressed or had accidents. <clears throat> you people at Blue Cross may think that $400 a month that has cost you to pay my psychiatrist is a lot of money, but think what it would have cost you if I had harmed myself with food or drink or alcohol or unhappy love affairs. You are coming out ahead, I assure you. Well, this is just to keep you updated while I wait for my letter telling me about the restructuring of Farm Policy Group 7's comprehensive major medical coverage for the future. Yours most sincerely, Rhoda K. Manning. <coughs> I'm just going to read you two more of the letters. Dear Blue Cross Blue Shield, I just got my flu shot. I didn't charge it to you since I just ran by the MediQuick and it only cost $5, so I thought it wasn't worth the paperwork. I have been racking my brain trying to think of something else I can have done for myself, or to myself, before I bail out of the health insurance business and devote myself to staying in perfect health until I am 65 and can get some of my tax dollars back in Medicare. <laughs> the John Alden Insurance Company sent a sweet young woman out to do a medical check on me. She called one afternoon at 4 and asked if she could come that day at, at noon. I guess that was to make sure I wasn't forewarned in case I secretly smoke or drink. I told her to come on, and she, she said that I had to fast from 8 that night until noon. That was the hard part. I never go 8 hours without food, as I believe in controlling the blood sugar at all times. <laughs> she arrived promptly at noon. It turns out she lives in my part of town. She said when she was ready to buy a house, she asked a policeman where the safest place in town was, and he said these old neighborhoods on the mountain. These houses were built in the 60s and looked like there would be nothing to steal. She came in and weighed me on a pair of scales she carries with her in a carpet bag. Then she drew blood and separated it into various little cylinders and sealed them up and put them in a pack to be taken by Federal Express to a lab in Kansas City. I had to sign a paper saying they could do an AIDS test. That's two in two months' time. <clears throat> I was glad to do it, as I told Sharon Crane, that's her name, if you aren't part of the solution, you're part of the problem. <laughs> a gay friend of mine told me that tells that to anyone who won't be tested for HIV. Next, I gave Sharon a urine specimen. She explained to me that they could tell from that if I had smoked a cigarette in the last 10 days or had a drink. I have not had a drink in 20 years. A hypnotist in New Orleans talked me out of that years ago. The way I feel now is that if the John Alden Jayla Care people don't have enough sense to want my $157.69 a month, after all of this, they can go to hell. <laughs> you may think from the tone of this letter that I'm getting mad at you, but you would be wrong. I have appreciated all those checks for 50% of my psychotherapy. I don't blame you for trying to figure out a way to get your money back, but I don't think there's any reason for me to give it to you. Yours most sincerely. <laughs> Rhoda came in. Anyway, it goes that there are about seven or eight more letters, but <clears throat> at the dinner dance that followed the, the benefit where we read these things, this beautiful young woman come to the United States from one of the African countries when she was about 14 and learned to speak English and now through this program had also learned to read and write. And she came up to me and my editor was with me and she said, I really loved those letters that you wrote. And she said, could I get a copy of that, that book because I have been trying to write a letter to an insurance company. <laughs> and my editor said, you will have it in your hands before the 
those dances over. And I've been thinking ever since I hope she didn't come. <laughs> Maybe I hope she did. <laughs> That's the time when I stay alone and do what I do. It's, uh, it's the best time of the day for me for anything. And, and when, I, when I'm finished with a project and, and I can use those hours for other things, I feel very, it, it's a real wonderful feeling to me to have the morning, to be able to go to the beauty parlor in the morning or to go run errands in the morning. I really don't have much use for the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> do you work on more than one project at the same time? Or do you <clears throat> start something until it's finished, work on it? <coughs> well, now, in the last four or five years, I'll, whatever I'm working on, I just work on that. I'll have other things, I hope, that I'll have other things in the back of my mind that I'm waiting to write or, or what I'd really like to have, which gives me a feeling of security and I feel like I have a job, which I don't, is to have some magazine assignments waiting, you know, something that, that I can look forward to when I finish writing a piece of fiction. But I, I really, I sort of live in the world that I'm creating and I'll cut it off when I finish work and go out into the real world, but I'm, I, I, I think that most of my unconscious mind is working on whatever it is that I'm writing. I mean, it, I may pretend, you know, to be out doing errands or going to the reading problem, mm -hmm. but if I'm deep into a piece of fiction, I don't know, I don't know what happens it, until I finish writing it. Or maybe I know what happens, but it's as if you've heard the report or something and you said, but what else, you know, but who was there? Tell me, I don't know the details. And if I'm, I don't know, I don't understand the writing process at all. <laughs> Maybe Joan Williams will explain it to you. I don't understand it. Do you, Joan? No, the, the, the more I write, the longer I do it, the more utterly mysterious it becomes. And I try to translate it into the real world of just the common imagination of how we make up fantasies about one another or how when we're young we'll see a boy that we barely know and create a whole world around him and a fantasy world with him or our children's fantasy worlds. But it's not the same thing as actually writing it down. There's, there's, something, there's a different degree of mysteriousness for me about this ancient, ancient desire to create fantasies out of words, just out of words. And I'm not worried about computers and the internet and videos and, and movies. I'm not worried about it ever ceasing in the world. this little girl named Aurora, who's 10. And uh, because she's the third of three children, the other children have always loved to be at my house and would stay alone with me. But I, it always took special attention to make Aurora comfortable with sleeping at night. Although, you know, she sleeps with me and still does. But years ago, I started telling her these stories. I told her that I had diamond mines up in Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then these big titted women who mined the diamonds for me, with big blonde permanents. And I'd always, because she wouldn't want me to leave, I'd say, I gotta get back up and see you. And I said, all the when I'm gone, all they do is stay down on Dixon Street chasing those little drunk men around. <laughs> and, they and they have gone on cruises around the world and, and all stood on one side of the boat and almost tipped the boat over. They've gone on diets and, and and, and gone to New York to be the chorus line of a show and almost never got home. And I've been telling her this story for years and years and years and years and years. But I can't believe you all think it's funny. <laughs> Aurora and I think it's funny. The other children don't even think it's funny. Whenever she's in my house at night, just when she's getting ready to bed, she's scrambling. Will you tell me about this big titty woman? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only, just that one child that I have this continuing fantasy life on. <laughs> well, I, I told my granddaughter about the China Bear That's funny, when my mother would tell me stories, that was how I wanted it. I wanted everything to be exactly like the other time. But I would read I, I would read books over and over and over again when I was a child. The same book. I didn't want a different story. A lot of Mississippi writers like Shelby Foote and Willie Morris have said you can never go back home. And I noticed that you went back home at one time in your life, and I know you primarily some of his books at NPR, essays on NPR. Did you find you couldn't go back home and stay there? Willie said you can't go back home. <laughs> That's when he was in New York. <laughs> when did Shelby leave Memphis? I didn't know about <laughs> Oh, he can't go back to Greenville. No, I couldn't go back to Greenville either because I, there's not enough to do. Was that the problem to do? I mean, I really couldn't go back. To Grace, Mississippi, I don't think I, you know, I'd have to start drinking. I, think. <laughs> I couldn't take the mosquitoes, which I used to tolerate as part of life. I mean, I'd be covered with mosquito bites all night, seven months of the year. I mean, that's why I couldn't go back. But I, no, I think, you know, once you've lived in a big city like Fayetteville, Arkansas, for 20 years. <laughs> I think probably what he meant by that, and probably something that's true for an artist, is <clears throat> if you've been gone and you go back into the bosom of your family, no matter where you've been or what you've done, you can only be the person you were in that house with that mother and father. You're all, you know, you're the neglected middle child trying to get attention, in my case. And I fall into the role. And if, every, if I'm there an hour, I'm into it. My voice will change. <laughs> and I like it. I mean, I think it's interesting, but... life going to school or something also ever since I began writing seriously and professionally I've been able to do nothing else and if it's the only free time you have it's and or, or if long periods of time go by and you can't write then sometimes it's hard to get back to it and, and you know for two or three days you have to make yourself in my case within one day I'll have fallen back into it. I'm more comfortable doing that than I am doing anything else in the world. Because I, re I really like to do that. Yeah, I do. No, I don't ever not want to do it. I, I wish I could do it better. Or um, 
or if I'm working on a novel, there are times, for example, <clears throat> if I've finished a draft of it and I finally let someone read it, which would be my editor, and even if he's called me up and told me that, he's li that he likes it and there's not much to do, I dread opening up the manuscript with any sort of editing marks on it. But that's just because I have a bad temper or something. It's not because I don't want to do the work. It's because, and I'm always relieved, it's never, you know. But, but a long time ago, the first novel that I wrote, The Annunciation, had to be vastly rewritten about 1,400 times. I probably think that's going to happen again. <laughs> Maybe it should. I think that I make most of it up. Even my, even my very autobiographical Rhoda stories, which are only autobiographical when she's young, the ones about Rhoda as a child, the first Rhoda stories, but even those are, uh, well, it makes me believe that we make up our real life. That's what I've decided for me. I mean, to a larger extent than I know. <clears throat> this was how I finally buried Frank. I finally buried Frank by getting completely outside the story into the effect that it had on someone who really didn't care who killed themselves as long as she could have her bedroom back. <laughs> it, um, thank you, thank you. I really just wanted to write in this voice about this little character I was making up. But I realized when I was into the story about four pages, I thought, this is it, this is finally over. This terrible suicide that, among other people, that's why the, the name of the story is Among the Mourners. And, I don't know. I've just been reading uh, Shelby Foote's letters to Walker Percy. And I've heard him say many times, Shelby Foote, that he does not let anybody touch his work. I mean, he will not change what he writes. And I thought to myself, he must have, that must have been something you've done since you've been successful. But <coughs> early on, when he had not made it, had this principle, he would not let somebody else change what he had written. For him. Even Walker, Walker wouldn't give him advice. Even Walker, what? Even Walker, he didn't let Walker even. I mean, oh, he no. and Walker didn't read each other. So? Uh, what I'm reading, Shelby Foote is his mentor. I, mean, I would believe that. I oh, would yeah. believe that. In the most elemental way, he was his mentor. But he was I don't let people do much to mine, and I regret the things that I let them do to the early work. Not, not to that, not to that novel, but their lines. And one, the first line of a short story that I, I mean, do, I, I don't know why I don't go back in. I'm always too busy to do it, but they're always reprinting these books. I don't know why I don't go back into the books, and it, it's usually just a line here and there, or a word or two. But I know it. You know, it's just like a hole in the stocking or something to me. I'm really, really sorry for the things that I did change. Yeah, he says it you know, interferes with creativity. No, it just it interferes with your own voice. If you don't become, you can't be a writer if you don't, if you can't become your own editor. You know, you have to learn how to rewrite and you have to learn how to be your own editor. And that's, that's the job of a young writer is to learn that thing find their own voice and learn how to edit their own work. But you don't even, I think that the only way you can learn how to edit your work is by having at some point someone else that you trust edit a few things. I mean, in Shelby's case, probably it was some really great English teachers when he was quite young. That would have been enough. That would do it, I think. If someone came to you and said they wanted to make a movie or a screenplay or something of one of your works, 
people option my work all the time when they write scripts, but I always have the right to reject the script. <clears throat> I think. <laughs> I mean, because uh, I guess there. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to the point where I would let someone really change something that I wrote. I don't think so. I mean, I don't have that much longer to live that I have to go around seeing. I mean, no, but 30 years? You know, 30 years is not there's too little room, as the poet said, to let somebody completely, you know, unless you couldn't pay the rent or something. But as soon as I learned how to read before, I mean, I was pretending to write as soon as I was pretending to read. But I don't know exactly what I thought I was writing. There were all those people, you know, sitting at desk, and all of my family were always reading and writing things, probably letters and ledgers and their checkbooks and things. But I saw those two activities as being mutual, and I always felt like I got, I mean, I just declared myself a writer. When I was very young, I loved books so much I just had to be belong to that world. Um, what, do you, what would you consider the difference between fiction and literature? Oh, I don't know. I probably couldn't answer that. Probably Tom could answer that better than I can, or, or someone. Who, I don't. I think maybe it's a it's it, for me it's a matter of intent. What I'm what I intend to do, whether I reach it or not. I mean, I worship the great writers of the world, Shakespeare, Faulkner. I worship the work that these people left in the world, and I aspire to that. Whether I reach it or not doesn't mean anything, but that's what I aspire to. I aspire to the great poets of the world. I think they should still teach Latin. I think we should teach Latin in the grade schools. And I think, you know, I can't imagine a college English department that didn't teach Shakespeare. Who knows, they may not give the University of Memphis any money to teach Shakespeare. They've got to make them take it. I mean, I don't know how to I, I don't know how literate people fight back against that kind of thing, except you just, you know, when I hear that sort of thing is happening in the academic world, I don't believe that it will actually happen. That is so far away from anything I can actually imagine happening. Yeah, write, write letters, write letters. So you, I don't know, write to the president of the college, because the dean's probably already knee deep in this. <laughs> I know it, I know it. <laughs> I did for many years write nothing but poetry. And uh, mm -hmm. there, 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 are two, there are two books, one of them is out of print. And the other one was published by a bookstore owner in New Orleans, and it's still down there. I don't know about my poetry. Somebody was talking to it this afternoon. I don't know about it. I mean, there's still, I'll open up a, a 
of the two books that I published, there are thousands of other poems. I think maybe uh, a lot of it has taken myself awfully seriously. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Come to the party to the reception afterwards. We have maps from Russell. The maps are by the back door over here. And uh, we're really glad that everyone came out. This is a fine party. And also, uh, don't forget to purchase books on your way out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.